story called uh, For Better or Worse. A powerful story of this couple, Bill and Gladys Ford, uh, living in Queensland. They were celebrating 50 years of marriage. Eight years earlier, Gladys was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And now, every day, the first thing in the morning, the last thing at night, in love, Bill does everything for her. He brushes her teeth. He feeds her, he gives her a shower. And she doesn't even know who he is. Why does he do it? Well, this is what he said. I found it an absolute privilege at this time in my life to be able to look after the one that I love. I just think I'm a promise keeper. I'm no big deal, I'm no special guy. I promised when we were married that I would love her in sickness or in health until death do us part. While I can, I will. I don't want to live to be a hundred. I want to live one more day than after Gladys goes so that I can look after her until she dies. She's just my girl, that's all. I just love her for who she is. She's my beautiful girl. And the reporter, Alison Langdon, saw that Bill and Gladys had this unbreakable bond. She saw the bond of love that binds together that with this couple, their kids and grandkids. A great example of love to a wife. We all show love to people, especially certain people in some way, especially those who are close to us. But how do we show love to someone we can't see? We say we are a church who loves and follows Jesus. So how do we show our love to Jesus? Well, this morning we're showing one example of how one man was told how to love, how he was to love Jesus. How did one man, Bill, love his wife with Alzheimer's? Given her situation, love compelled him to take eternal prayer for her. For her. In our story today, we see another man whose name is Peter. And he's called to, to love. And we see how he's called to show his love for Jesus. Uh, Peter is told in an important conversation with Jesus... For him to love Jesus means for him to feed others and to follow him. And so let's look this morning at this uh, final chapter of John's Gospel, where we find this teaching that contains this uh, miraculous catch uh, and an important conversation. And after we think through this, we'll look at what that actually means uh, for us today as a church. So, so John 21 begins with some of the disciples going for a fishing gallery. Uh, Jesus has already told them that uh, he would go ahead of them into Galilee. And so these disciples, they're, in a sense, just waiting for Jesus to appear. And so we shouldn't think that Peter has abandoned Jesus' mission in order to return to his old job as a fisherman. He was just going to do what he, what he knew to do, go fishing. It's probably been a while since he's waiting and so he decides to go go for a fish while he waits for Jesus to appear again. And then the arrival of Jesus, there comes this a miraculous catch that we, that we read before about 153 fish. I like to go fishing. I love fishing. Well, 153 is more fish than I've caught in my entire life. I get in one net. And so again we see Jesus is providing for his disciples feeding them breakfast. And one of my favourite places to go is Torquay. And what I love to do, I love to buy breakfast there and just have it on the foreshore. I love that so much, I almost drove down to Torquay on my birthday just so I could do that. But as good as that sort of breakfast is, I, I just imagine this breakfast on the, the foreshore of the Sea of Galilee, how good it would have been. The, the risen Jesus there, just serving his disciples. Feeding them. But this is nothing new, is it? As we've seen throughout John's Gospel, we're looking at it, Jesus has a, been concerned with feeding his people. Back in chapter 6, we saw how Jesus feeds the 5,000. In 
Jesus, the good shepherd, has promised to keep and feed his sheep as they listen to his word, we saw in chapter 10. And so these uh, words the sheep are listening to are the words of Jesus teaching about his words and his work while he's here on earth, as we see in John 14. And so now as we get to John 21, uh, in this a final sign of the gospel, we see the, the risen Christ miraculously feeding his disciples. And also, he's there reassuring them that they are now equipped to, to go out and to feed his people. And so, we can see at the end of this gospel, at the beginning of this sort of post-resurrection era, to the end, Jesus is concerned with feeding his people through what he has fed the disciples. Jesus will always feed and provide for his people. Even those who have failed him. So a couple of weeks ago in John 18, how the disciples just deserted Jesus. Most clearly seen by Peter. And he's denial. And so we may be tempted to think, well, really, are these guys, are these disciples, are they, are they really authentic? The real deal? Are they still up to the task? But Jesus here makes it clear that they are. When Peter, no doubt, he would have felt a great level of shame after what he did to Jesus. And so John records for us that conversation that between Jesus and Peter. I assume they're just going for a walk along the, the lake. The conversation is recorded for us there from verse 15. I'll read it again. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my name. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You, you know that I love you. Jesus said, be mine. And the repetition of the questions, do you love me? When Jesus asks Peter three times, it's, I think it's deliberately recalling that those three denials of Peter, of Jesus, back in chapter 18. And the fact that Peter himself was hurt at the repetition, I think it actually adds weight to the link of his past failure, of his repetition of denial. But that is now in the past, and now Jesus graciously calls Peter, Peter back into his service. Jesus is reinstating Peter as this now under shepherd, under Jesus himself. And so listening in on this important conversation, we can see what Peter needs to do. And we know that Peter's going to become the chief of the apostles, the, the head of the church. And so there's a specific role that Jesus has for Peter. So after declaring his love for Jesus, Jesus tells him that if you love me, then you will feed my word to my people and you'll follow me. Jesus is pretty much saying, if you want to be a pastor, a, as a shepherd, then feed my sheep. Don't starve them, feed them. Make them your highest concern. And Jesus had fed the disciples, and now Peter is taught that loving Jesus actually involves feeding Jesus' people. He needs to feed them on Jesus' own words. He needs to teach the people of God about Jesus, about his works, about his word. Peter needs to spread the message of Jesus, the message of forgiveness and eternal life. But why does Jesus put so much emphasis on feeding the sheep, feeding his people? 
Well, it's because when Jesus' sheep are fed, when they are when they're nurtured, when they're filled with this strength of Christ by, by His Word, then they actually become this mighty army who's then turned loose on the world. Take a baby. A baby has no influence on a culture, does it? <coughs> Sits there, cries, sleeps, sleeps. Before a baby can turn the world upside down, they have to grow up. They have to become mature. And it's the same with Jesus' people. When they are fed the Word of God, they become mature. And it's only then that they can start to then influence the culture. Have an impact on the world. And being fed God's Word, for us, it's the only way you become mature as a Christian. And so Jesus, He will always feed and provide for His people. And how does He do this? Well, it's through His shepherds. And so Peter and the disciples need to feed Jesus' the people. And not only does Peter need to feed Jesus' sheep, he himself needs to keep on following Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. And we see, uh, in a, we'll start Peter's decide to follow Jesus in the chapter, no, even while he's still on the boat. He can't wait to be in Jesus' presence. He won't wait for the boat to get back to the shore. He just jumps in and swims back to the shore. He just can't wait to be with Jesus. He wants to be where Jesus is. He wants to follow Jesus. And part of following Jesus is doing what Jesus says. And if you notice that even though Peter and the other disciples in the boat, it's Peter that actually responds to Jesus' request. In verse 10, look. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So who is it? It's Simon Peter. It's the one that goes and climbs back in the boat and drags the net ashore. Peter just wants to make up to Jesus. He wants to do everything that the Lord asks him to do. And he will. Jesus calls Peter to follow him. We see it in both verse 19 and 22. But in this section of verses 18 to 22, we see just how costly it will be for Peter to follow Jesus. For Peter to follow Jesus, to feed Jesus' sheep, it will mean that he will have to follow Jesus to the point of death. Peter will die because he followed Jesus. Peter will die because of the message he brings. What a change in Peter. Chapter 18, he's just so fearful. He denies Jesus. Just a, a complete contrast to who Jesus is at that point. But now, chapter 21, he's actually compared to Jesus. The matter of Peter's death is going to be a similar one to what Jesus endured. See verses 18 and 19, but very truly I tell you, when you were younger you dressed yourselves, went where you wanted, but when you were old you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and leave you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Before Jesus' crucifixion, Peter bragged that he'd be willing to lay down his life. For Jesus. And now after crucifixion, Peter is called to do just that. To lay down his life on behalf of Christ and so that he then glorify God. And as tradition tells us, Peter was crucified upside down at the hands of Nero and Rome. And we read that when Peter sees John sort of dragging along, come, coming behind them, Peter asks Jesus, well, well, well then what about John? Is he going to have to die like this too? And when Jesus replies, pretty much, what, what happens, John, is none of your concern. I'm not going to give you a prophecy about it, what happens to each one of you. Just follow me. Do what I require of you. School 
holidays, they're, they're almost about to end. So the kids have been home a, a lot the last uh, couple of weeks. And I've heard, it's not fair far too many times. <laughs> it's not fair they get to play the station more than I do. It's not fair. Why don't they have to do the job that I have to do? It's not fair. I've done so much more housework than they've done. It's not fair. They, they're staying up later than I am. We can laugh the kids. But often we as Christian adults do the same. We want things fair too. The Lord gives me a hardship. I don't think everyone should get a hardship. It's unfair. <laughs> Someone else gets a blessing from God that I don't get. What's, what's the matter with me? Why, why don't I get that too? Why hasn't God blessed me in that way? I think this is sort of the, the idea that Peter has in his mind. When he's saying, well, what about John? The Lord has jobs for each of us to do. And what he has for others, good or bad, it's ultimately none of our business. Each of us must do what God has given us to do. As a side note though, history does tell us that John was the only one of the apostles that wasn't martyred for the faith. Although he didn't escape persecution, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And so Peter has been served by Jesus. And now Peter is ready to serve Jesus and follow Jesus. And it's not just Peter, but it's all the disciples are called to serve. And they're all the disciples that are to be ready to follow Jesus to the point of death. If that's the path that he's chosen for them. In our love for Jesus, would we be willing to do the same? We should be. So what about us today? Well, it's a passage uh, and teaching, and it, it's specific to Peter, isn't it? But in the New Testament, now this role of, of feeding the sheep, feeding Jesus' people, it's actually brought in to all elders. I remember in Acts 6 that we looked at last year, the the ministry of the word and prayer, that was a role for the leaders. Now Paul, uh, in Acts 20, then uh, he calls all the Ephesian elders. And he, he calls them, he says to them, they're to be shepherds of the church, of, of God. And later, Peter himself, actually, in 1 Peter 5, he calls there the elders of the church, he calls them shepherds. And so as the apostles, as they, they die, it's the shepherds, the, the elders in the church, it's then their responsibility to feed and care for the sheep. So here at QPC, it is Tony and my responsibility as your elders to feed you God's word and to spiritually feed you. As a pastor, as a, a preacher, as a shepherd, my role is to feed you. You are my flock. Under God. My responsibility, Acts 6, is to teach you the word and to pray for you. As Stephen Lawson tweeted this week, the preacher must feed the sheep. That's the role. Feed the sheep, not just entertain goats. That's my job. And knowing this is a role of a, a shepherd, a role of a pastor and elder, if at some time uh, you're in the position of needing to choose a church, say if you're moving to a different area, or a different state, for example, well choose a church where the shepherds will feed you. So in this passage, the, the risen Christ feeds his disciples of this is this miraculous catch and then has given them a task of feeding his people. The sign of the miraculous catch and this conversation between Jesus and Peter shows what's a key priority, what Jesus' key priority is now. 
And if it's Jesus' key priority, then we'll want to have that priority as well, won't we? If Jesus' priority for the, the period between his resurrection and when he returns is that his people should be fed through hearing the apostles' teaching, the word of God, then we should make it our priority too to be fed on that teaching ourselves. I mean, John, he's now, he's recorded Jesus' words and his works for us to read and to know, for us to feed on. We can trust what the, the apostles have written down, verse 24. They've written down Jesus' words and works for us. So how do we feed on what is written? How are we as sheep going to be fed? What should you do? Well, church needs to be a priority. Because this is where God's word is, is read and preached. That's what we're doing now. We are feeding on the Bible. We're feeding on Jesus' words and works. And I hope you're feeling filled up and not starved. The sermon is time for you to be fed by the preacher. So don't skip church. Come and be fed. But also during the week, to make gathering in a Bible study a priority. This could have where we can be fed again. If anyone just ate once a week, they'd be skinny. be very skinny and would say they're malnourished. Yeah, that's, would, we'd all say well, that's just not healthy. That's just not healthy. But so many Christians try to live off a once a week diet. And it's just not healthy. So make it a priority, even when you're tired, you go, go and be dead. And by coming, you'll actually encourage others as well. And in turn, make your shepherd's job easier. It's hard to feed you and care for you when you don't come. When you don't come to church or Bible study. And read the Bible for yourself. Like, be fed every day. You can get through so much more of the Bible by yourself than we can ever at church or in through a Bible study. So friends, don't neglect your spiritual food. Be fed. But as sheep, do we just keep on eating and eating and eating and eating? That's all we do? Well, no. We don't just do that, do we? As Paul later tells us in Colossians 3.16, we are to teach one another. So there is a sense in where we need to feed one another. Which springs from the fact, though, that we're, that we're being fed. Shepherds need to feed the sheep, so then the feed, sheep can then feed one another. And as it turns out, most of us will find, our situ- find ourselves in a situation, especially sometime in our life, where we will have a shepherding role. Whether that is as a parent with your kids, a grandparent with your grandkids. Could be as a Bible study leader with your group, Sunday school teacher, or with your kids. There is your tiny, tiny flock. Your family, your, your grandkids, your group. Feed the sheep. Whatever it may be, that whatever responsibility we have, we have a res- in that leadership role, we are to feed them God's word. God's word. Think about it. what's the first job of any parent? It's to teach their kids the gospel. As leaders of the church, we want to help parents with that. Oh, we ran a course last year. Because we want to help parents in teaching their kids the gospel. Parents, you must keep this as your most important job. So discuss today's sermon with them. Engage with them about it. And each week, do regular questions. Read the Bible with them. And 
not just read it to them, read it with them. And so you, you show them what you're reading and how to understand it, how to apply it. Pray with them. Teach them how to pray, more than just praying about themselves. To pray, praising God, to pray in thanksgiving to God, help them to confess their sin. Have conversations with them, explain the gospel over and over and over again, showing them how their heart is deceitful and sinful, and that they need Jesus just like you need Jesus. This is how to feed your flock. Bible study leaders, your job is to teach the flock. Sunday school teachers, your job is to feed the flock. The parents remember Sunday school is there just to assist you in your feeding of the kids spiritually. It never takes a role of a parent. And one other way that I would love to see happen in this church is for one to one Bible reading. Two people getting together, maybe over coffee, a cafe, at home, it doesn't matter where. Getting together to read the Bible and pray together. Feeding each other. Over the years, when I've grown the most to Christians, when the time when I've met one on one with another Christian. And so I'd encourage you to do this with church. Ask someone to do it with you. Don't it just at the start, just go, let's just catch up once. Let's catch up every fortnight. And you might get to weekly or something like that. Something that can help you be fed. Let's be a well-fed church. So as a church who loves and follows Jesus, let's invest in each other. Let's be, let's be regular near a church and involve them through it so we can be fed and we can help to feed others. That we will love Jesus all of them. The Jesus who we read in verse 25 did many other things as well. In fact, every one of them were written down. John supposed that even the whole world would not have the room for the books that were written. It's amazing, God. We have His Word. So let's read it, be fed on it, and grow spiritually. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that it points us to Jesus. May we be fed upon this. May we know Jesus truly and love him. And please be with the elders of this church. Help us to feed your sheep and feed them well. Lord, give us great wisdom as we do that. Lord, help us in our role, whatever we have, to feed your sheep. Lord, help us to have a great love for them. Help us to really be a church that loves and follows you and loves your word. So please do this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.